Yo, what's good everybody out there? Thanks for listening. This is Mega Ran, and you are tuned into another high speed, high impact edition of Mega Rant's Matt Mania. It's a podcast about wrestling, professional wrestling, not amateur wrestling. Um, usually WWE related, but uh, we jump around occasionally. But uh, thank you for joining for this special episode. I have a really, really awesome guest. One of my oldest friends on the internet. And that sounds really weird to say, but um, this is Steve of Rap Reviews that I'm talking about. Now, anybody who's been on the internet and knows anything about hip-hop knows Rap Reviews. They know the online hip-hop lyrics archive, or maybe they know the Angry March podcast. Steve runs them all. And uh, honestly, I've been listening, not necessarily listening, because I didn't hear his voice until I visited uh, Omaha one time. But I've been reading his work for many many years so it was an honor to get on the phone with him and chat wrestling not just any wrestling but we talked hardcore wrestling now hardcore wrestling was a big thing back in the you know 90s and 2000s and uh thanks in part mostly in part to extreme championship wrestling now before we get into that i just want to tell a little bit about what i've been doing the last I don't know, few days um just came back from tour the tour with Richie Branson, which did not actually have a name, and I didn't realize that until I was halfway into it, it didn't have a name. But the tour was super fun, man. I gotta say, this is one of my best tours yet. Uh, I think I'm getting better at this tour booking stuff. I know I was talking about not wanting to do it anymore. But uh, bad news is that everybody got sick, except me. Um, knocking on all the wood around me to hope that I didn't get some late bug. But uh, big shout out to Richie Branson, big shout out to LJ Beats. Who held down DJing and filming duties so we should have some documentary footage coming up on my YouTube very soon he's also an amazing video director and my new song Macro Sky has a video and uh, LJ did that and um, I'm gonna have links to that in the podcast description so make sure you check it out check out all of Richie Branson's amazing work he's doing with Otaku Gang um, Big man, I can't even, I don't even want to take too much time because I know I talked for a while with Steve, so I don't want to take too much time, but the tour was amazing, particularly the Bay Area, man. Bay Area came out in full force. I mean, it was Sacramento, San Jose, and San Francisco really showed out. Uh, big shout to AFK out there, Elbow Room, we had a great show, and Sa Sacramento was a place called Soul Collective. Uh, with Homeboy Sandman, we played those shows with, and um, they were great, man. I some of my better Bay shows, and I've had some really good Bay shows. Um, my wife also came out, and uh, she got a little um, crazy off the edibles. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but but you know why not? It makes for entertaining podcasting. I'll just deal with that when I get home. But um, she took some edibles and um, proceeded to go crazy like to the point where she was out of her mind a little bit they must have some psychedelics in them and uh she was worried that she was embarrassing me but in actuality i think her worry you know was much worse than what it actually was and i think the worry is what turned it into an embarrassing situation because no one would have noticed i mean it's san francisco if you ever walk around in downtown san francisco you can't tell who's on drugs and who's not but anyway um it was fun action-packed uh thrill thrill a minute man i went to a wwe event so big shout out to austin creed aka xavier woods for hooking us up um i got a chance to meet aj styles the phenomenal aj styles and we went to a great event in san jose i also went to 2k and i uh, got myself in a little trouble when the um guys from 2k games encouraged me to cut a promo on xavier woods holding the world title the 2k title and uh that led to some nonsense but um i'll play those for you and then uh we're gonna get into the actual meat of the podcast okay so here's my promo. so xavier woods i heard you're the champ well how could that be when i have the belt <laughs> you know yeah. possession is nine tenths of the you may be the new day but this is the new night <laughs> 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 the champ is here so good fun right like simple 15 second thing that i just completely came up with on my own big shout out to richie for the new night thing that was awesome so 
as we're walking through doing our tour of 2k not even 15 minutes later i get a little text bing and it is this epic promo bomb by xavier woods first things first a belt is something that a civilian uses to hold their pants up i'm fairly sure that the two of you are wearing one right now second this is a championship title and I won this championship title in tournament play. I won this championship title in tournament play. So if for some strange reason you actually believe that you could even almost be a pretender to my throne, you need to rethink your entire life. And second, if you end up walking around in public with that around your shoulder, just like you were the real champion, then Ran, I might have to go a little extreme and put you down with your own weapon. Woods out. See, absolutely unfair. Uh, first of all, I did a 15 second thing to fit Instagram, Twitter, and those other sites. He did a one minute promo that would not have fit on any of those social sites. Automatically should have been disqualified. And he pulled out the Mega Buster. You couldn't see that, but that's what he's referring to. Unfair, unfair. Anyway, uh, we're gonna have to settle this one and hopefully a future episode of Up, Up, Down, Down. And if that happens, that'd be awesome. Anyway, let's get on with the episode. Let's talk hardcore title. It's 1998 all over again. Anyway, big shout out to my man, Steve. Big shout out to Rap Reviews. Big shout out to you for checking us out. It's Matt Mania. Make sure you are four star, five star, 18 star in it. Thumbs up in it. Commenting and telling friends. Here we go. Matt Mania. Hardcore title. Yo, what's going on, everybody? This is Mega Rand with another action-packed episode of Matt Mania. This one's going to be different than most, and it's going to hopefully start a new trend. Because um, as a history buff and with uh, the advent of great products like the WWE Network, which is only $9.99. Um, I've been able to go back on some cool and interesting eras of wrestling, some of them that are, you know, long gone. And uh, one of those that was on my mind this week is the Hardcore Title. So I have a special guest, Mr. Stevie J of the Angry Marks Podcast. Steve, are you there? Yes, I am, Ran, and thanks for having me. We're going to get hardcore on Matt Mania. Hardcore. I think we should always say hardcore that way for the entire um, podcast. It's kind of like when Paul Heyman comes out, you have to say, Brock Lesnar. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so you did mention Brock, so I want to give um, you an opportunity to talk about yourself a little bit, just the beginnings, you know, where you come from, who you are, what you do, and what's your history with wrestling. Well, I go, right, back, go. I go back way, way back before Brock Lesnar. I go back to the 1980s when it was Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, the Million Dollar Man, Jake the Snake Roberts, Superfly, Jimmy Snuka, all the great WWF wrestlers of the 1980s, and of course, the American Wrestling Association, which my grandfather was a very big fan of, too, so my mom always says I got it from him. You know, he loved Vern Gagne and Paul Orndorff and all those guys, and he had a satellite dish just so he could watch wrestling, so I, I was pretty much born into it, but as for me personally, outside of professional wrestling, I also run a little website called rapreviews.com. Some of you may know my interviews with Mega Ran from that website, some videos, some audios, some cool stuff we've done over the years. Ran and I have known each other for, I'd say, at least a decade now, right? At least a decade, dude. I mean, I feel like I've known you longer than that. I've been reading rap reviews from the beginning before I was even, you know, releasing records. So, uh, yeah, man, it's at least been a decade because I've been putting out music for a decade and you've been reviewing it for that long. So, Wow, that's that's crazy. You might be my oldest internet friend, which is... 
That's insane. That's yeah, cool, though. <laughs> but I, I can't take all the credit because it's not like I'm the only person at RapReviews.com. we got a whole talented staff. Many of them have reviewed your albums over the years as well. So I, I don't like to toot my own horn and say it's just me. Like like my wrestling site, too, Angry Marks. I couldn't do anything there if I didn't have a whole crew of people who contribute and help. They make it what it is. That's awesome, man. And, and you know, everybody's – every business or every – product or every project is only as good as the crew helping to put it together so glad you got a good crew um i always have a hard time finding good help but you know once once i once i do i keep them and i hold on to them absolutely yeah, and make sure to uh to praise them whenever you can just like k murdoch anytime you two do a project together i know it's special and that's why you're always with him and down to ride with him Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're working on some new stuff too, and we'll we'll chat about that on a different podcast. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> but today it's about hardcore. <laughs> All right. So now, uh, really quickly, I want to get your opinion on. So you've been in the business or around, you know, the business, and a big fan of it for about as long as me. It's the eighties. I've dipped in and out. You know, uh, got back in in the nineties. Dipped out a little bit early 2000s and have kind of been back in for at least the last maybe three, four years, like really hardcore. So what's your opinion briefly on, I guess, the differences? Because we're talking about the hardcore era. So um, now with the PG era going on, like, what do you see are the big differences right now and um, some positives and maybe some not so positives? Well, the hardcore era, if we want to call it that, from the 1990s, was a response to WWF in the late 80s and early 90s, becoming very cartoonish, very unbelievable, very very character-driven, but not characters as in people with larger-than-life personalities. I'm talking about characters like... Doink the Clown and Bastion Booger, things that the audience couldn't relate to. So when Eastern Championship Wrestling slowly morphed into Extreme Championship Wrestling, their attitude was, we're not like those other guys. We're real. These are real fights. You're going to watch something real if you watch our product. And they became a cult phenomenon. Just like when you get a great underground rapper who has a great record and suddenly everybody else tries to sound like that record and tries to duplicate that sound because it became the hot thing, you had WCW and WWF imitating ECW because they were the cult product, they were the thing everybody was talking about, and eventually that led to WWF having its own hardcore title with hardcore rules and stipulations that changed over years and over time, but in reality, that was actually a very short period of time. It was only four years that the hardcore title was in existence and defended before it was eventually merged with two different titles. First, the Intercontinental title, or was it first the United States title? Well, it got merged. I'll, I'll go back and double check the history. Yeah, it's really crazy that it was only, there were only a few years that, you know, as far as we know or we thought that, um, you know, it seems like a really big era in wrestling. But, yeah, it was a pretty short-lived thing. I mean, the Hardcore Championship started in 2000, or 1998. And uh, after big, you know, rises of the ECW Promotions Hardcore brand of wrestling becoming more popular. And there's some really, really cool stuff. And so we're going to dig throughout the history of the Hardcore title. And we're going to give you first a few tidbits. And then we're going to have a mock tournament of the best Hardcore champions of all time. So first, we're going to start with some notables. The first champion was Mankind. And in 1998, this belt was awarded to him by Mr. McMahon. Do you remember this story? Yes, they basically were doing an angle where Vince McMahon was incapacitated and needed some, I guess you could call him muscle, but more like... Uh, some, somebody who could run interference for him if he ever got in trouble because he was getting around on a wheelchair. And McMahon and Foley had never really seen eye-to-eye, -eye, but 
McMahon could manipulate him, and he was going by Mankind for a long period of that time. So when we say Foley, we're actually talking about Mankind. As, as we all know, <laughs> Foley had three different faces. He was Mankind, Mick Foley, and Cactus Jack. Oh, well, and Dude Love. So I guess yeah, I technically three different characters under one name, Mick Foley. But I, I digress. The point was <laughs> McMahon presented him with this hardcore title and said that he had lost a son in Shane McMahon betraying him but that he had gained a son in McFoley. He was m- emotionally manipulating him to do his bidding. And there was a great <laughs> moment from that scene where McFoley's walking away with the hardcore title he's just been presented, and Vince McMahon is rolling away on his wheelchair, and Mick says, Thanks, Dad. And McMahon <laughs> gives him this look like, No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was done really well at the time to create you know, some sympathy for mankind. Uh, not too much earlier as Dude Love, there were just these huge feuds between him and Austin. So Dude Love was like McMahon's crony, if you will, who would um, just attack on, on behalf of McMahon. And uh, and this really created the, the huge face turns of probably one of the biggest good guys of all time, you know, as as mankind. And uh, this was the this, this stepping stone, I think. And it was McMahon giving him that title. Uh, him fighting, I don't. He didn't even keep it very long, but it was. It led to some some cool matches. But then right after that, it was. There was literally the springboard that kind of sent him up into the into the main main event picture. Yeah, the most memorable and, uh, match was a cool time. Was when he wrestled Ken Shamrock in a tuxedo on Raw. Came out with the <laughs> wingtip shoes and the suit, and his hair slicked back, and they were like, "Oh my God, it's corporate mankind." <laughs> Yes, this was the time when, you know, going corporate became the thing. And, uh, yeah, there was the corporate mankind. I remember the slick back hair. Jeez. <laughs> wow. And what's oh, even man. funnier about that is he had Big Boss Man running interference for him. He couldn't defend the hardcore tile by himself. He got some of Vincent's flunkies to help him. Right, right. <laughs> oh, man. Other notable moments, a little bit forward in time, a, um, a gentleman by the name of Crash Holly whose um, contributions to the WWF exceed his, uh, his stature. But um, he instituted the 24-7 rule. You remember this, right? Oh, yeah. He basically cut a promo and said, I'm the greatest hardcore champion there's ever been, there ever will be, and I can prove it to you because I'll put this belt on the line. Anybody, anywhere, anytime, you want a shot at me 24-7, you can come in and try to take a shot. You got a referee, come and try to pin me and take it. <laughs> Now this this created a lot of excitement, and um, it's now it's made for the shortest title reigns and quickest title changes in WWE history. Oftentimes, even at house shows, the belt would change hands during matches. It would change hands several times during a programming hour, even. Um, changed like because eight or ten times at two different WrestleManias. Oh man, who could forget the the giant hardcore? Battle Royal, where, yeah, there was like 10 times in that. Uh, Maven, or not Maven, Raven, which rhymes with Maven. Well, they uh, because actually of both this. held it quite a bit, both Maven and Raven. Sorry, go ahead. That's true, they have. Uh, but thanks to this rule, Raven is a 27-time hardcore champion. And I didn't even realize that until I started reading up on this. I'm like, whoa, I know he won it a lot, but... 27 times. Yeah, and Crash Holly's pretty close behind him with 22. That's why they called him the Houdini of Hardcore, a name given to him by Jim Ross. Yes, I love that. He would just pop in and win a, win a match and run off with the belt. Like, that was that was pretty cool. <laughs> just the visuals of him running away were half the fun of it. Like, when he'd get into that ball pit, when, when they chased him down to the Funplex in Brooklyn, and, and he got out of the ball pit and ran away with the title as, as all three members of the Mean Street Posse stand there looking dumbfounded, he got away. <laughs> this was some great TV, man. I thought the hardcore title made for some amazing tv i mean well let's talk about matches though are any any matches stand out for you like as amazing hardcore title matches i think that that once some uh, some really solid mid carters got into the mix you know the rpds the the hardies things like that i thought that we got some really interesting matches but do any stand out for you i'm gonna throw one at you that i think has actually been forgotten by a lot of the fans al snow and hardcore holly 
at St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Road Dog had been the previous hardcore champion, but vacated the title due to an injury. So this mm-hmm. match was to crown a hardcore champion, and they brawled all the way from inside the building in Memphis all the way out to the Mississippi River. They were fighting in the river. Oh my gosh, I remember that. Wow, that's going to be my uh, my must-watch match of this episode. I think you guys should check that out. I was just watching that pay-per-view, actually. It was a really entertaining one. The uh, Okay, so Al Snow versus Hardcore Holly in the finals of the Hardcore Championship Tournament. Wow, I do remember this. Oh, man, fighting in the river. That was, <laughs> that was amazing. And, and, of course, there were... Was- items planted all around the river purposely for them like oh. you wouldn't find a stop sign in a wheelbarrow and a chain link fence just laying around but miraculously they all happen to be there i don't know if you were in philly they'd be by the river maybe I don't know. <laughs> what, for, for taking the <laughs> you might load. find even worse things by the river in philly right but... like dropping a 210 pound load in the river that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> yep that kind of thing uh, oh man uh, so there have been four women who have held the hardcore title. Uh, Molly Holly, Trish Stratus, Terry Runnels, and one of the Godfather's hoes. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of the Godfather, we, we announced last episode that uh, a leaked list came through and that Charles Wright will be one of the Hall of Fame inductees this year. Charles Wright, a.k.a. the Godfather, a.k.a. Kama Mustafa and uh, Papa Shango and others. Uh, do you, real quick, since I... Since I I mentioned this word. Do you think that there will be any mention of the HOs during this ceremony? I think it would be almost impossible not to because you just referenced the fact that Charles Wright had several different gimmicks in WWF, but his most popular gimmick, the one that people remember him for, is the whole train. If he, <laughs> if he can't come out there and say that to pop the crowd, then why even have him take the induction? Yeah, that's gonna that would be interesting. The train. Yeah, it is WWE <laughs> Network. You know they don't have to censor it. It's it's already going to paid subscriber. Nah, that's a good point. You know, I think I don't know. I remember. I just think back to those that conversation Triple H had about China and how you know her things extracurricular stuff was kind of keep, keeping her away from the business and um, and from the Hall of Fame. And this is a guy who runs an adult club in Vegas. Mm-hmm. And it on has television. some real life hoes, not just some TV hoes. Yeah, yeah, this, was, this wasn't just a gimmick. Like, this guy kind of lived it, still does. Um, the, uh, the club he owns out there, I forget the name of it, but they list on the website that if you come Friday or Saturdays, you will see the Godfather there. And, um... So, I don't know. Do you think that's a little bit of a double standard? What do you think, sir? I suppose you could argue it's a double standard, but I also think the difference here is that The Godfather is not starring in adult videos <laughs> and marketing them to people. China and Sonny, that's a whole different kettle of fish. That's why they don't want to induct China, and they're kind of mad at Sonny right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, but this will be interesting, man. I was actually a fan of The Godfather, I got to say. Um, oh, yeah, and he could pop the crowd like nobody's business. He, he got one of the biggest reactions every time he came out. Absolutely. He was so over. And um, I thought he was a decent wrestler, too. I mean, I, I enjoyed him in the ring. Very underrated. And, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Former Intercontinental Champion. And um, the 24-7 rule led to the uh, inspiration from a lot of people's perspectives and mine too, I think it kind of sounds similar as um, the money in the bank concept. Uh, do you think that those are related somehow? I think you can find a spiritual connection between the idea of the money in the bank being something that's anytime, anywhere can be cashed in and used. It's definitely reflects the anytime, anywhere rule of the hardcore title that Crash Holly brought in. But There's also the fact that Crash Holly occasionally had that rule suspended for certain situations by the Commissioner McFoley or by various authority figures who were uh, looking to have a match take place on pay-per-view. So even 24-7 wasn't always 24-7, and Money in the Bank ain't always Money in the Bank either, because 
For example, you can't cash in on a wrestler who's incapacitated or not medically cleared. When you cash in that money in the bank, they got to be able to get up and fight back. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. All right. It seems like these rules, you know, they're kind of made to be broken, bended, or twisted. So, <laughs> Well, it is professional wrestling. It's a rule until it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, I love the short memory aspect of of wrestling was like, I've never seen this before, like, <laughs> except last year. Well, you that's know. one of the reasons we miss good old JR because JR would never say <laughs> that. He would actually tell you he remembered what had happened 15 years ago. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I said, as a, as a history buff myself, you know, I really enjoy the historical, you know, the references to the older things. So I did love that about seeing JR out there. Uh, okay. So I got a couple memorable, moments and i want you to maybe add on if you got a few um i gotta always remember and I, i'll never forget the image of shane mcmahon falling off of the titan tron versus steve blackman now do you remember this match don't you yeah SummerSlam 2000 and uh shane mcmahon had two or three really famous matches there's another one where kurt angle threw him through a glass window that everybody remembers but oh yeah this that one was brutal this one would be right up there at the top, and literally at the top, because Shane McMahon was so desperate to get away from a pissed-off Steve Blackman that he started climbing the scaffold trying to get away, and Blackman caught up to him, started whooping his ass, and he fell off backwards into a crash pit. But, of course, we didn't were supposed to know it was a crash pit, but, you know, that's the only way he could fall. And, of course, they're exaggerating on commentary. They're saying, he's up in the air 50, 100 feet. He's probably only up there... 15, 20 feet, but still, the visual of him <laughs> flying backwards off the scaffolding is unforgettable. Absolutely. Oh, man, Shane took some sick bumps for the company, man. I, that, I, I, I appreciate that. I feel like Shane should be a Hall of Famer at some point. <laughs> Big Show and Raven in WrestleMania 17, uh, the golf cart situation. Do you remember this one? <laughs> Well, this to me is both the good side and the bad side of hardcore because it was a fun match, but it also became a cartoon. The visuals of them running into each other with the golf cart, crashing through walls, throwing themselves through windows, it it became a spectacle and not a match. It And you could tell that they were trying really hard to make it look like a real fight, but unfortunately for me, watching mixed martial arts over the years, having seen enough real fights, it starts to become obvious when people are just pretending to hit each other with things. <laughs> yeah, it got a, got a little crazy. Um, like choking freshman. somebody out with a garden hose, for example. That ain't going to work. When you've seen a real rear naked choke, you know that a garden hose ain't going to choke somebody out. Not unless you got like some ridiculous technique and superhuman strength. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, for those of you who didn't see it, this is a hardcore title match um, with Raven, Kane, Big Show. Raven plans a spot where he would hop in the golf cart to try to escape. Big Show would hop on the back at the last minute and start choking him. Raven was supposed to take off with Big Show in one golf cart, and Kane was supposed to grab the referee and take off after them in a second golf cart. Chase was planned to go the length of the entire Astrodome's concourse. Uh, according to some uh, some interviews that I found. However, only mere seconds into the chase, Draven, Raven drives the golf cart into a fence, and the wheel gets stuck <laughs> in a hole between the fence and the floor. Not wanting to blow the spot, Raven then tries tugging the golf cart back to continue the chase and almost gets run over by Kane, who's driving right behind him. Would have been a pretty memorable comedy piece, but um, yeah, it didn't quite work out. Um, but that notwithstanding, WrestleMania 17 is probably one of my favorite WrestleManias. Though. It was a very good show. And I, for me, part of the thing that stands out about that WrestleMania is Paul Heyman on commentary going back and forth in a very adversarial relationship with Jim Ross. And the two of them mm. getting in fights with each other on commentary was maybe planned, maybe not planned, but it, it added extra drama to the pay-per-view as a whole. Oh, absolutely. All right. So, any memories, memories real quick, moments of hardcore title matches any you got in the old memory bank? Well, since we're talking about Big Show, 
I'm going to bring up from the same year as WrestleMania X7, No Way Out 2001. Mm. That, that was a crazy match. Big Show in this era, for those who haven't seen it and gone back and watched it on the network, this is a very young, skinny Paul White, a.k.a. the Big Show, a.k.a. the Giant. This is when he looked more like Undertaker than the seven foot, four hundred pound, whatever they bill him at today. He was he was a trim big show. And very athletic at this point too. He could move gracefully, but this match didn't require much grace because Raven just nailed him over the head over and over again with a stop sign. So there ain't nothing graceful about that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, it's so funny watching the older, you know, Big Show stuff when he was, like, skinny, young, you know, and uh, almost looks like a different guy. Uh, uh, it's pretty, I guess it's cool to see the see the growth and the changes that people's bodies go through, but it's... And if you like female ninjas, this is the match for you, because there was a, a hooded, <laughs> masked up, vigilante female ninja trying to win the hardcore title, who got blasted with a trash can lid by Molly Holly. I remember that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, um, all right. We're going to talk about the top 10 hardcore champs. We're going to break them down, and then we're going to throw them into a tournament, and then we're going to pick the winner. But first, we're going to take a little break. I'm Megan Rand. This is Matt Mania with special guest Stevie J. I'll be back in a moment. See ya. Hey party people, it's Kate Murdoch here, and I want to talk to you about something real fresh, real new that myself and Mega Rand are doing now, and it involves you, the fans. Myself and Mega Rand just launched a Patreon, a monthly way for you all to subscribe to us and what we do. For as little as one buck a month, you'll get free exclusive downloads, a guaranteed song a month, and if you pledge at the $10 level, you get a free project a month, whether it be something we do together, whether it's something solo, a side project that I engineer or produce is guaranteed exclusive for you Patreon supporters. So, if you really like what we do, then this is the time to get down and join us. We are trying to bring back that Nintendo Fun Club vibe because this is essentially a fan club for the real fans. So, check it out. Patreon.com slash bits and rhymes. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash bits and rhymes. And now back to your regularly scheduled program thank you yo what's going on everybody this is mega ran and i am in the place to be on matt mania talking hardcore wrestling with my man stevie J from the angry marks podcast and rap reviews here we are we talked about moments we talked about history let's get into the top 10 hardcore champs now i got a few picks you can tell me if you agree or disagree but i'm going to tell you why all right First, Mankind. And then just historically, I think Mankind, because of him being the first champ, and I think you think about hardcore when you think about Mick Foley. Um, he didn't... He hardcore before the term hardcore existed. <laughs> exactly. And after the term existed. So, so I feel like Mick um, belongs in this conversation strictly because of you know, his history, not necessarily because of his uh, his time with the title. But um, but yeah, I think him being the first champion is uh, symbolic and um, never went after it after losing it that first time. But he had bigger fish to fry. He was he was winning the, the world title on Raw. So anyway, uh, that's one of my picks. What do you think about Mankind? I have to 1,000% agree because he literally put his body on the line for professional wrestling. And Mick has said this in his books and interviews, and he will deny that he's a handsome gentleman, and I actually would argue that he's pretty ruggedly handsome. But back in his day, he thought, well, I'm not that great looking, but I can take good bumps. So if I take a good bump and the crowd reacts to it, then I've done my job. So... He, he practiced from a young age, from jumping off his roof to uh, jumping off the tops of cages and crashing through The Undertaker. That was kind of his M.O., and he was not afraid to give it up. He got hundreds of stitches, lost two-thirds of his ear, had so many burns on his body that I can't even count them all. The man sacrificed himself, and I when I met him last year, I told him that. I'm like, Mick, you didn't have to do all those things, and he just smiled at me and said, well, I did get paid. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean that's what they got to remember. I mean, he 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 sacrificed so much for the business, definitely. But you know, he wasn't doing charity work. You know, like <laughs> he got handsomely rewarded for taking those sick bumps. But yeah, I'll go back and watch some of those matches, man. That match with Triple H, I think, it's no way out. And um, some of the sick bumps he's taking, it's like, man, Mick, you could have, you could have put your hands up on that chair shot. Like you totally could have done that. But no, you know, I'm glad he just you takes brought- it. Uh, you, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in too early there, but you brought up a point that I did want to make while we were talking about hardcore, and it's that we know different things about concussions now. Not that we didn't always know that concussions were bad, but the more this has been studied in the NFL and combat sports, it's becoming pretty clear that there are devastating long-term consequences to being hit in the head repeatedly. And while some of those shots were gimmicked, a lot of those shots weren't, and yeah. that's the thing that I we talked about the comedy value of hardcore, but the sad aspect of hardcore is that some of these guys probably shortened their lives or ended their careers by taking too many shots to the head, to various parts of their body with weapons that they didn't need to. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, we're we're thankful for them, but yeah, it's it's they it took an extreme extreme. You know, total on a lot of these guys. Right, and that's why, um, I, I guess in hindsight, I'm glad the hardcore era was only 98 to 2002 because I, I think the business started to change in the 2000s, and I think it needed to change. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, so my next pick for top 10 hardcore champs, Rhino. Rhino and ECW legend. Uh, had three reigns, had a really good match in Backlash 2001 with Raven, and I think just always has been synonymous with the extreme style. I mean, you just imagine him goring people through tables. Like, it's it's just it's become a thing, like, because of, you know, Rhino's innovation. Uh, what do you think about Rhino? I think the things that he had going for him, besides what you already alluded to, was that he came from extreme championship wrestling and he had that reputation that guys who came out of that promotion had for being really tough and really physical. He also had a a stature that made him imposing. He wasn't the tallest guy, but he was broad and thick. And when it looked like he was going to put somebody through a table with a gore, he, he wasn't just you know, I'm going to take this and you're going to fall through it and we're going to make it look like it's cool. No, you felt like he was physically imposing his will on the person and driving them straight through it. Absolutely. Uh, I was a big fan of Rhino. I always like the bigger guys, you know, they're a little more stocky. That's why I'm a big Kevin Owens fan and other guys, Mick Foley as well, you know, as a big guy. I always like to see some big guys getting down in there. And and Rhino didn't have the height, but man, he just had that, that intensity. And that was really all you needed. Yeah, and he got that straight out of Detroit thing going for him, too. Like, you don't <laughs> mess with a guy from Detroit. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, I wonder if there's, like, an accountant in Detroit who's like, yeah, I'm from Detroit. <laughs> you know what? There me. probably is. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> all right. So uh, so we agree on Rhino as a pick? Definitely. Rhino make it? All right. Uh, this one is a weird one, and um, but I think if you follow it, Follow me on this one. My next guy is The Undertaker. Undertaker, I feel like, brought the hardcore championship some legitimacy. This guy was just going out and just demolishing people during the uh, invasion angle. He would not just win the title, but he would, like, choke guys out. He would just absolutely squash them. And um, and I thought that was that was fun to watch. I guess it was kind of bringing, the, bringing back a little bit of a, um, not necessarily a UFC kind of thing, but... But Taker came back, started doing some of those some of those submission moves, and that was that was cool to watch. So I thought, you know, and this was underrated, but I had to re- go back and find it and uh, watch some of his hardcore matches. And I was like, well, these actually were pretty entertaining, and um, it, it kind of made the hardcore title like some must see TV. Uh, what are your thoughts on Taker as a hardcore champ? I think this uh, is probably part of the reason that I'm more nostalgic for biker taker than some of my friends are because <laughs> i do remember this era of undertaker where he was less gimmicked up and had more of a badass personality and would just go out there and get in these really rugged and violent matches with people like the match that he had with jeff hardy on raw the ladder match 
that mm. to me still stands out as one of the greatest matches that Taker or Hardy ever had. They both bled and sweat and just destroyed themselves just getting over that match. And when Undertaker won the match but still saluted Jeff Hardy afterward by raising his hand, that was like him passing the torch saying, hey, kid, you got this. That's awesome. All right, so you agree with Taker? Definitely. He, he may not be thought of as a hardcore champion, but he definitely he he made the hardcore title his own during the time he was competing for it. Absolutely. And you're right, you know, a lot of my friends, myself included, don't think too fondly about the uh, the ABA era of um, Undertaker and, and the biker stuff. But I got to say, though, this was the best part of that of that era for him. I mean, it was it was a great move. I never saw it coming. And um, and I loved the way these matches went. I thought it was awesome. You know, I felt like what other what other veteran you know, would have done some, some of the crazy stuff he did at that time. Right. I don't know. So here's uh, my dark horse probably for top 10 hardcore champs, Shane O'Mac. Now, Shane McMahon uh, took the sick bumps that we talked about. The SummerSlam 2000 match is super memorable for, memorable for that. Um, him and X-Pac had some great feuds. I think that was mainly for the European title. But uh, I think Shane O'Mac because because of his contributions to the business side, I think he was amazing on the mic um, and just wasn't afraid to take a crazy bump. I mean, he, he would always cheat or have, like, the Mean Street Posse or something like that around him. <laughs> oh, who can forget Pete Gass and those guys? But, um, Joey Epps. But, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, they ain't taking me back. But, um, but Shane's a pick where I'm, I'm, like, 50-50 on. You know, I feel like... I don't have a lot of super memorable moments of Shane getting over in, in the hardcore division, but um, I felt like his matches were always entertaining. What do you think about Shane? I think Shane is probably valid because we remember him for spots that he did more so than matches that he had, but the spots that he would do were so memorable that they loom larger than life even today. Like, I could still visually picture Shane McMahon putting a trash can on an opponent's head and doing a coast-to-coast drop kick from one side of the ring to the other. He, <laughs> he didn't have to do that. He's the son of the boss. He's got millions in the bank, but he'd still go out there and try these insane things, and he pulled them off more often than not. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, your take on Shane O'Mac. Is he in? I'd say yes. All right. Okay. Well, we'll get to the end, and then we'll maybe have to do some elimination. <laughs> yeah, we're got... getting a lot of people in here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I got I got ten, but we got to go to eight for the tournament. So two got to go. All right. Next is Jeff Hardy. Uh, you mentioned Hardy's matches with Undertaker being amazing. Roll out of prestige. Of course, had some you know the crazy offense and things that you remember from the Hardy Boys matches. Brought that to the division. Uh, arguably had the best hardcore title match ever versus RVD SummerSlam 2001. Um, one of my favorites, just because you wouldn't expect him to, to get down, but, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears he gave to it always made those matches super entertaining. Uh, what's your take on Jeff Hardy? Hardcore Jeff Hardy. I suppose if, if we're going to get down to comparing them to the other people on this list, I'd have to rank Jeff higher than Shane McMahon because... Shane would just do spots, but Jeff would do entire matches. Jeff had a psychology to when he would do things. He would wear people down before he would go up and jump off the ladder and crash them through a table. It, there was a, a structure, and that's what you want in a professional wrestling match. You want it to have a build, you want it to make sense, and you want it to have a dramatic conclusion. And Jeff would give you all of those things, whereas Shane O'Mac, much as I love him, he'd just give you some big memorable spot, but maybe not the whole psychology altogether. Hmm. All right, okay. So Jeff would be ranked higher than Shane, and I agree with that. All right, big boss man. Second hardcore champ ever. Had the longest title reign ever, 97 days. And uh, I still remember his match at fully loaded 99 versus Al Snow being an entertaining one. Now, I got to be honest, I wasn't a, you know, bad guy, big boss man fan. But, you know, he was he was tough, man. He made it look real. And, I mean, when he would smack you with the, uh, the knife stick, dude, I... I'd feel it, you know. He <laughs> he had a he had a way to really make it look good, and um and he would brutalize guys. I remember him 
choking out Al Snow or people like that. And you're thinking like, this guy's killing him, you know? And um, I don't know. So for that aspect, I would, I'd consider boss man, but again, not, not the biggest fan of, of the in ring stuff, but I thought as far as hardcore goes, he kind of, he kind of embodied it, you know, because he was really snug in there. What do you think? I got to say a few things about him. First of all, uh, he died way too young, 41 years old, rest in peace. The man should have been with us much longer than that. That's that's too young to be taken in any line of work, let alone professional wrestling, and he's still missed to this day because he was a very colorful, unique personality, and I give him credit for reinventing himself multiple times over the years because this is a guy who'd gone all the way back to the 80s and feuding with the top stars of WWF back then, and worked his way from WCW to Independence to getting back into the WWF spotlight again in the late 90s. So, yeah, tr- truly a master of reinvention. But I also have to say, he goes down in history for having one of the all-time worst professional wrestling matches ever. Not not his fault, really, but this is a WrestleCrap Hall of Famer. So, shout out to R.D. Reynolds and Blake Braxton on that tip, because the <laughs> kennel from hell... Oh, no. Yeah. And, and <laughs> no. supposedly vicious dogs in the kennel that were timid and didn't want anything to do with this stupid match and were just busy <laughs> pooping themselves in the corner trying to get away from them. It, it, was, it was bad, man. It was real bad. <laughs> Probably the worst gimmick match ever. Yeah. <laughs> top, top five at least. It ranks yeah. right up there with like the triple cage from WCW. Oh, man. <laughs> Wow, the kennel from hell. I think that's something I kind of blocked from my memory there. Wow. Well, thanks to the network, you can go back and watch it. It's Unforgiven <laughs> 1999. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, you guys should maybe check that one out if you if you. And, and the whole feud, it, it just is a really bad feud in general. This is, again, people are nostalgic for the Attitude Era, but there are some things that aren't worth being nostalgic about. And the fact that this feud was centered over the fact that allegedly the big boss man took his dog, chopped it up, and made chili. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know if we want to be nostalgic about that. No, no, we don't. We don't need to. We don't, you know, it wasn't all gold, and I, I'll be the first to admit the attitude era wasn't all gold. There was some stuff. Oh man, and that that was probably one of the worst. Oh, man. They, they were trying so hard to to get ratings, to win the war with WCW, and to be the most infamous product on television. That sometimes they just they didn't necessarily filter out the bad ideas because they thought if people are talking about it, it's good. That's not always the yeah. case. Not always. No, no, no. All right. So, Big Boss Man, rest in peace. But uh, what are your thoughts on the current list we got here? Does Boss Man belong? I want to say yes because he had the longest title reign, but he didn't have the best matches. He had one of the worst matches. Mm. <laughs> and, and as much as I respect him individually, if I'm making a list of all-time greatest hardcore champions, probably not. Okay, that's fair. That is fair. All right, now. Next, we're going to Mr. Monday Night, the whole damn show, RVD. Uh, Rob Van Dam's four-time champ, I feel, has some of the best matches in the division. Still has the weakest punches I've ever seen. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I would always get, you're like, what is he doing here? This, these punches are just like pillow punches. But um, uh, And he was the last champ. Uh, we'll talk about the ending of how, how hardcore and WWE ended uh, later on. But um, I thought RVD's matches were awesome. Um, he really, I felt, cherished the title and had some had some cool cool matches and cool spots. What are your thoughts on RVD? No, you weren't making a put on the fact that he had a hardcore versus ECW world title match with Mike Awesome, were you? Because <laughs> that was one of the most awesome matches ever. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. That was that was a great one. But he, he, for a lot of people, will personify hardcore more than any other wrestler just because they like the high-flying moves that Rob Van Dam would do and the fact that he brought that era with him from ECW into WWF. He, he was synonymous with that style in ECW of going over the top literally and physically with your body 
and they expected that out of him in WWF, and he never let up. He gave everything that he had in ECW to WWF audiences. Yep. Absolutely. So, does RVD stay? RVD would be up near the top of the list, actually, because the matches right. that he had, the the height he could get on a five-star frog splash, Let, let's forget about the weak-ass punches. We can overlook that. Cause <laughs> yeah, we can overlook that. It, it, the, you just wanted to see Rob Van Dam do his spots. When when he was in a match, you were just on the edge of your seat waiting for that frog splash, waiting for the Van Terminator. You you just yeah. wanted him to do those spots. They were so fun. Oh, absolutely. He was super fun. Speaking of fun, the epitome of fun in the hardcore division, the one and only Crash Holly. Now, I have him on my list because I thought he brought that comedy aspect, made it very entertaining. I mean, just picturing him running off with a title at any time is, is brought a smile to my face. And um, and bringing a scale he, with him to the ring, too, because he weighed in at allegedly over 400 pounds. <laughs> yes, he would call himself a super heavyweight. I love that. <laughs> oh, man, the scale. That reminds me of the game. I think it was WrestleMania 2000. They would have Crash Holly come out in the game holding the scale. And I thought that was so cool. Um, <laughs> he inst- instituted the 24-7 rule. I feel like... He might be more of a you know a legacy guy who because of his contributions outside of match quality you know could belong to some-